well, it's getting towards the time anyway, I think. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything to say while we're just sitting here waiting? I'm assuming you can all hear me. Thank you. All right. Well, if everyone's happy, I am going to start because I hate hanging around when it says we start at 12. I kind of like to start at 12. Um, my name is Michael Crow, um, and I'm part of PAC. Um, I have a, for those that may or may not know, I have a background in doing some, uh, a number of years of IT management. And I know that's not got not much to do with research, but that's where I did my project management. And it has interested me uh, when I got more into research about um, how can some of the ideas from project management help research because research is often, um, you know, runs over time and it's kind of difficult to manage. So it's one of the reasons why um, I've looked into this just a little bit. And hopefully I can change slides at some stage, lovely. Um, so the aim of today then is to describe some of the benefits um, of using a project management approach to research projects, whatever that research project may be. Um, and an overview then of what we're going to get into today is I'm just going to have a, a quick review and it is a very quick review of the research process and how that integrates with project management. And then through some um, six kind of key or what I think are key points from project management that can be used uh, to have a look at um, in relation to your research. And then I just have a few just general management they are kind of part of um uh, project management they kind of go into the the risks end of things of your uh of managing various things within a project and um, if you have any questions or you want to interrupt me at any stage please either do so or use the chat i have a, a chat window open so i can see um if anyone is uh, making any comments so or if you don't understand something just ask me and i will um try to explain it a little bit better all right so first the research pro process so um when you're doing sort of background research um lead um sort of leading to things like uh, literature reviews or just to get some idea of what's happening or to put context on research ideas. It's usually thought of as, as you know, a couple of steps that are, uh, first of all, you decide what your research is and then you look at some theories, concepts, terms or ideas around your the research area. So who, what, when, where, why, how, um, and then you look at 
uh, getting information from different sources like the academic literature or practice guidelines or government information or from professional associations. And so it all sounds very um, straightforward and easy. However, if you've ever done any background research, you quickly realize that you get into some sort of a vortex um, of just generally looking at different things on the internet um, and getting sidetracked and not been able to really concentrate on what you're doing. And eventually you end up, if you're like me, sort of cleaning the house or the windows just because it's different to what you should be doing. So it is sort of a, a very strange thing when you start doing this research and start reading the background literature. And it's kind of the same for the research process um, and doing primary research. It's usually taught and shown as been a very logical process of step by step. You just go through the steps and it's really, really easy. Uh, first, you start with your research question and then the research design and then into sampling, ethics, data collection, data analysis and reporting your results. However, Although that's the way it may look, it is actually in reality a bit more like this, where you're doing or looking at various parts of research at the same time. Um, and it's a little bit difficult to manage all of this and to get everything happening because there's so many demands in so many different areas. Um, so that's where project management comes in. Um, it's about putting some sort of control over this very difficult to manage um, process. So uh, that's why we need some sort of uh, um, uh, framework to help us to, to manage the whole thing. Um, and I guess one of the first things is to find a, a project and does a project is it the same as research? Is research a project? So a project is usually defined as something that is temporary. So it usually has a, a defined start and a defined end. A, a lot of times that's done by date. Um, you need to start something on a particular date and end it on another date. But there are some projects that uh, don't necessarily have start and end dates, but more have um, de definite things that are required and that defines how the project happens. Uh, projects are unique, uh, where unique is defined as new or at least new to you, um, or you haven't done things in a particular way before. Um, so it's, it's going to be different from your everyday usual way of doing things. Um, and then a project, you know it's complete when you have achieved your goals and objectives or when those goals and, uh, goals and objectives are no longer viable. So that's the def definition of project management. And research is generally temporary because it usually has a defined start and finish. It is unique in that if you weren't doing this piece of research or there wouldn't be any point in doing this piece of research if it wasn't unique, if it wasn't new to you, if it wasn't new to the world even, um, or you haven't done a particular type of study before or just studied this topic. And completion is usually as well uh, when you've achieved certain goals and objectives. Okay, so that's what a project is. And project management then is usually defined as the processes, knowledge and skills needed to bring a project, or in this case, research to completion, given the projects or the researchers constraints. So from my point of view anyway, um, projects and research are very, very linked. Okay. And the whole concept then of project management is a bit like Google Maps. Um, it tries to let you know where you are, where are you going, and how are you going to get there. Um, so it, it, as I say, it's a framework. Um, so one of the things on the previous slide was this whole idea of constraints. Um, and that's the first thing we're going to talk about on projects and uh, what that means. So uh, the usual 
way of looking at uh, constraints in projects, um, and I think it's a little bit limited, is uh, looking at scope, quality, and uh, cost. Um, I also put in there time um, because um, it is really important. Time is usually the one that, that gets uh, is a problem for research. It's getting things done in a particular within a particular time frame. Um, so my take on what's called the iron triangle is actually to put scope in the middle and then quality costs and time around the outside. Um, now scope is defined as a detailed description of what you want to achieve. Um, and if you've done research in the past or you're currently doing research, one of the things you know you have to do is to do a research proposal. And that's basically your scoping document. It's saying, what exactly is it that I want to achieve over the period of this piece of research? So it's setting it out very clearly what you want to do. Um, and this becomes really important um, if you're doing research with other people because it's very easy to get a bit sidetracked and to go down different uh, pathways because you see so many interesting things. And it's always then uh, you're always able to go back to the scope or your project proposal or your research proposal and say, well, hold on, we stated that these were the things we were going to look at and those things therefore are out of scope. So it, it helps you to keep track of what it is that you want to achieve in the project and not get sidetracked or keep adding things on. Um, quality is your agreed standard for the end product. Now, quality is quite difficult to define um, but in this case, it usually is that you are setting a, a standard. So if, for example, you were doing some sort of practice guidelines, you'd know that you want the quality to be of similar guidelines already produced. Um, if you were in an academic sphere and you're heading towards a master's or a PhD, for example, they're the, the standards that are agreed on. So you, you've got an idea of what is required. Um, cost then is human and material resources, um, or what, and as well as that, what budget do you have to do all this in? And time then is the schedule to complete the project and when to set up when different things need to be done. Um, now, one of the reasons why I sort of put this cap on things is because generally when you're doing your research, you can choose, or any project in particular, you can choose to control any two things of quality, cost, or time. So for example, if you want to have a really high quality product and you want to cost it to cost as little as possible, then time is going to be the, the constraint that blows out that you have no control over. Uh, likewise, if you want something to be of high quality and you've got a very tight deadline, then cost is the thing you can't control. So usually there's this sort of friction between quality, cost and time and trying to fit them into the scope of what you're trying to achieve. Okay, the second thing is deliverables. Uh, this is a kind of very project management word is deliverables. Um, and basically it's any major component of the project. Uh, it's usually defined as something that's tangible. Uh, so the written report, the article that you're writing, the clinical guideline that you're trying to develop or whatever. So it's this tangible output because one of the reasons is from a psychology point of view, when we see the end product um, and it's tangible, you can hold it in your hands, it becomes uh, more real because it is real. Whereas if we keep our deliverables as been intangible, it's harder to do, define exactly what we're trying to do. Um, there's usually then a hierarchy of deliverables. So you have your overall project and then that down below that you have your deliverables and then down below them you have your sub deliverables. So each sub deliverable um, is working towards your deliverable, which is working towards the overall project. Um, so there, there's lots of things that can be in deliverables, lab 
notebooks, uh, proposals, lit review, uh, some sort of a report. As I say, it's uh, even things like presentations. So a slide deck uh, or your PowerPoints for um, a presentation becomes something that's tangible. Um, it also helps you if you look at deliverables is to keep in mind what is the thing you're aiming towards at the very end. So if you start with your main deliverables and work backwards from there, you get a better idea of what's involved. Um, I've gone through the tangible results has been important. Um, it also helps you to define dates on when things can be done. And we'll talk a bit more about that in schedules. Um, and also because you've got other things to do. So it, it also um, um, allows you to, to build into what you can deliver based on all the other things that are going on as well. Um, deliverables um, are usually seen as well as a bit of a system. So you've got inputs like your time, your resources, money, um, other outputs that you've created from other places. Then some sort of tools or techniques are used that convert those inputs into outputs and eventually into deliverables. And then any of your outputs are directly leading to the sub deliverables and the deliverables. And it's one of the things in project management is that if there isn't an output and outputs are usually defined as um, tangible as well, then something didn't happen. Okay, and this is where things like in meetings, for example, if meeting minutes aren't produced to say what happened and what decisions were made and what are the next steps to take, then that meeting never occurred within a sort of project management perspective so that everything along the way gets documented so that you can then go backwards if things go astray and you can say, okay, well, here's when the decision was made and here's who made the decision and why it was made. Um, and that's where we uh, ha have problems from that point on. Um, so you can learn from mistakes. Okay, the next key thing in project management are the stakeholders. Um, stakeholders being really, really important. And that's a word that's thrown around a lot that you know we have to take care of the stakeholders without necessarily defining who they are. Uh, the main ones tend to be you as the person doing the research or in charge of the research, any advisors that you might have for the research, and then strangely enough or not, any participants or patients or clients involved in the research are also stakeholders, which is why we get to uh, issues around ethics as well. Um, so you, you may find that there's more. So if you're doing the research within the hospital system, then uh, Queensland Health or at least the uh, the health areas might be stakeholders as well. So it's just about trying to understand who are all the people that might have a, a stake or might be interested in the research. Um, and what you need to do with stakeholders then is to keep them involved and doing that is communicating with them. So you communicate progress, any problems that you've come across in your research, any outputs that you've done, um, you let them know about them. You also talk to them or let them know if there's um, any, when there's any problems, they may have ideas and solutions to those problems. Um, so that's the communication aspect. You also, one of the things to do is to manage your stakeholders. And when we say manage stakeholders, what we're saying is that you need to um, uh, let your stakeholders know what the expectations are. So what is it that your research project or what you can achieve um, and when it can be achieved. And you also need to understand what influence each of the stakeholders has on the project. So some stakeholders want to have lots of influence or do have lots of influence on the project and others not so much. Um, and it's understanding that level of influence which we kind of know in a in a way. So if you're doing um, a major research project and you do have a group of advisors, um, they obviously have a lot of influence over the piece of research. Um, and so as a result, you need to then manage 
those stakeholders a bit more closely and what the expectations are. Um, it is important because poor stakeholder management usually leads to things like miscommunication and miscommunication then leads to problems and clashes around the research and what's expected. Um, and it, with those things as well, uh, going back to previous points is that's why there's things like de deliverables um, and having outputs that are tangible why meeting notes are taken so that you know what happens in meetings and then further back having your project proposal so that you know what's in scope and out of scope for your project. Um, it's quite interesting because um, just sort of I suppose I'm talking a bit more from an academic point of view because that's what I've been doing um, but you know I often find if you're super supervising students that you'll um, um, give them lots of ideas um, and students then think that those ideas are things that need to be incorporated into the project whereas a lot of the time it's just literally that ideas and it's up to you uh, the student as the researcher um, to decide which ones are important and that's where this whole idea of poor management or poor communication comes in in that you can uh, be both from advisors and um, um, researchers, a, a better communication of what is expected from ideas and inputs and all the rest of it. Um, one of the big things that we need to do in projects and also in research is to develop a schedule. And one of the ways we do these is to set milestones, which are usually set dates um, of when deliverables and sub deliverables are required along the way and then from that deciding how much effort is required for each of those deliverables and it's not just putting in you know infinite effort for each uh, deliverable or sub deliverable it's how much each of those deliverables where what reward you get from them so if you're asked to do you know a talk on your research to a secondary school um, it may take quite a bit of effort but from a project point of view only um, there may not be much reward from it so therefore you have to decide how much effort is really required in it whereas for a final report that's wrapping up a project or a piece of research then that actually requires a fair bit of effort because again that's exactly what you were trying to achieve or it's writing down exactly what you did achieve um, putting together a schedule like this also gives you a better understanding of what exactly is involved and all the steps that are involved for the research. So breaking things down into smaller and smaller achievable tasks. So what that again, it's what we usually do. You've got your deliverables, you've got your sub deliverables underneath that, and then each sub deliverable will have a tasks attached to it, which are usually one of the smallest things um, and then so you're trying to develop your schedule around those tasks and figuring out how many tasks are required to uh, meet a sub deliverable and then all putting all those sub deliverables together to meet the deliverable um, it also um, helps you to manage and measure progress again from a psychology point of view it's good to see progress so having these tasks and being able to tick off the tasks that you've done and um, it helps you see that you are achieving things as you're going along rather than it's just going on forever and forever um, estimating duration is actually quite difficult so all the scheduling um, and things usually take an awful lot longer than we think um, and everyone gets caught by this and it takes quite a bit of practice not to get caught by it um, and when you're dealing with um, advisors versus you doing research um, the level of task difficulty for an advisor might be quite low but for you is quite high because it's something that's brand new to you so that can also lead back to things like communication uh, and your stakeholders. Um, 
But usually as well with research, there's this sort of U-shaped progress uh, of motivation. So um, at the very early stages, you're waiting to get, you're trying to get going and you've got a lot of energy and motivation and enthusiasm. And then over time, it breaks down. And then as some sort of deadline that you've scheduled uh, starts creeping up in you, your enthusiasm and motivation goes up and up and up and up and up. And then it starts to wane again. And it, it by understanding that these sort of U-shaped things happen, um, it's a good way to just understand that this is pretty normal, you know, that your level of enthusiasm does increase and wane over time, depending on what other things are happening. Um, and also by creating a schedule, you can also schedule in breaks and holidays and try and balance you know, the research versus work versus actually having a real life out there as well. So that is a reason for doing things like schedules, because within the schedule, you can actually put in, you know, school holidays are in this block. So therefore, nothing is getting done during that time because I'll be doing other things. Um, and that's really important as well. There are quite a number of scheduling tools and systems available, and I'm just going to show you a few because scheduling is one of the, the key things in, in a research project or any project. Uh, the first one is a rolling timeline. Now, I know this is set up for students that are at university, um, and I was trying to uh, change this to be a bit more applicable to you guys, but I couldn't think of anything to tell you the truth. So I went with this because I, I reckon most of you have been to uni um, and have done projects at uni and stuff. So a rolling timeline is about breaking things down into different periods of time, whether it's, you know, years, months, semesters, trimesters, whatever, uh, and then deciding on outputs per week. Um, and then deciding what you do within each week and within which each day of each week. So you each week you plan out in advance, you follow that, and then say on a Friday, you plan for the next week and you keep doing that. So it's rolling. So everything isn't planned out at the, from the very beginning, but it's planned out so that it rolls over week by week or month by month. And if something is really new to you, um, this can be quite a, a good way of doing it. Um, it does have a number of disadvantages in that you may spend a, spend too much time doing certain tasks that really don't need that amount of time because you don't have a fuller schedule in place. Um, a very common tool in uh, project management is a Gantt chart. Um, you can get some templates of Gantt charts from Microsoft. So create.microsoft.com uh, for both Excel and Word. The Excel ones would be slightly better if you can use Excel. Um, if you have access to MS Project, you can try using that. It does far more than Gantt charts, by the way. But again, Gantt charts are all about saying what tasks need to be done, when do they start, when do they finish, and usually how much effort is required as well for each uh, task. It can go into a lot of detail around resources required and budgets and all the rest of it. So um, it's it's Gantt charts are really helpful that way. Uh, one of the good things about Gantt charts as well, it can tell you what things can be done in parallel. So you can do two things at the same time because basically someone else is doing parts of the project on your behalf, perhaps. And so things can be done in parallel and therefore reducing the overall amount of time required. Um, Big advantages to Gantt charts is it's a nice visual way of showing things and you can actually put an awful lot of information in it. Uh, uh, one of the disadvantages is that it takes quite a bit of time to set up and to understand basically what the Gantt charts are. Uh, a simple thing to do, uh, again, looking at different templates, is just to set up a calendar. Uh, you can download Word or Excel calendars from uh, Microsoft uh, templates again, or you can buy those um, 
or get those wall charts, you know, of days of the year, and you can just start putting in things on that. And again, that's just a, a simple way um, if you're used to looking at calendars of putting in information. So um, calendars, you know, who thought? Um, a, a system that I use quite a bit is called a Kanban board. And you can do this quite simply with just a wall and post-it notes. Um, so you can put post-it notes and write on them each task that you have, stick them to your wall, um, and maybe have a, a little heading called to do. Um, and the priority of tasks goes from the top of the list to the bottom. Uh, and then when you're doing things, you just move your post-it note over into your doing column uh, that tells you what you're doing right at this moment in time. And then when you've done it, you can stick it in the done column. As I say, you can do it with post-it notes or index cards. I use a piece of software called Trello, which for, um, uh, for personal use, um, there's a, a limited free version, which is fine for me just doing my own stuff. Um, there are also lots and lots of very complicated software out there that does things like uh, Gantt charts and Kanban boards and other things all in the one sort of package. So there, there are lots of ones out there. Um, uh, some of you may have heard of uh, Atlassian, uh, Atlassian, Atlassian whichever, uh, the Australian guy started up that company and it started up with all this project management stuff. Anyway, neither here nor there, I guess. All right, fifth topic is risks in a project. Yes, there are risks. There's risks in anything that we undertake. Um, and the whole point of risks within project is to try and identify them early so that we can see what risks are there and then we can try and minimize them. Uh, so a risk is defined as uncertainty about a future event and it's usually made up of a likelihood and the impact. Now you, well, sometimes or most of the time there isn't, we can't do much about the likelihood of an event, um, but what we can do is to minimize the impact. Um, so what things can we set up when we've identified the risk that can reduce any impact on the project um, if it comes to pass at some stage during the project. Um, so we're thinking about lots of things that could um, affect the project. And we tend to, uh, in project management, you list them from the worst one. So in that little sort of diagram there, the, the 25s will have a very, very high likelihood of happening and have a very, very high impact on the project. And we try and to reduce them down so that the impact is less and less. If we can, we can reduce, sometimes we can reduce likelihoods, um, but I'm not really going to get into it because yeah, we'd be here all day. Um, and basically it's about having a plan in place. What do we do if so? Um, certain risks to a project that are ones that come up regularly are, well, me or you as the person in, in charge of the project. Um, you're trying to balance things like, you know, study, life, work, hobbies, interests, whatever, um, uh, and also a lack of understanding of the area or the, the research that's involved. Um, so there are risks to to the project. Um, advisors and managers also have introduced risk into the project. So if review or feedback is slow, or if they keep changing requirements, again, go back to your project scope or to your research proposal to try and get over that one. And so there are two common ones for advisors. Uh, one risk to uh, any research is that you and advisors or managers or supervisors or whatever have misunderstandings. Again, communication helps to, uh, to drop that. Um, data is also one of the risks. So things that uh, affect, I suppose it's more students, is that the project has already been done by someone else 
before, even though you're halfway through it and you suddenly realize it. Uh, one of the big things for a lot of research projects is uh, a lack of participants and how to enroll more participants in research to get a good sample size. Um, or another one is that the data you're getting from participants is of poor quality. What do you do then? So these are the risks you think about them and you try to put plans in place. Uh, also, just I have put this under here because it's research involving human beings, ethics um, and following ethical guidelines, not so much a risk, but a requirement for research. Um, but it's not that I've, I'm have i um, ignoring the whole area of ethics. It's just um, uh, that it doesn't necessarily come up a lot in project management. Um, for some strange reason, because most projects, well, that I've been involved in or have been around, um, you know, IT systems and, you know, ethics around people isn't a big thing in those cases. Okay, um, what does project progress mean? Uh, this is actually kind of an important one. Um, it's usually measured in deliverables and outputs. So of well, deliverables and sub-deliverables and outputs. Um, so that you are meeting your scope, that you are developing within your project exactly what you're trying to achieve, that um, the costs are being kept reasonable, that you're not going over budget or not spending too little, which can have its own problems, that the quality, that the standards are being achieved as set out, that the project is on schedule or close enough. Uh, one of the ones that's not talked about an awful lot, which is important, is taking corrective action. Um, and in projects, it's important to one, realize when things are going wrong. And when you realize that things are going wrong, going wrong, what have you learned from it and what have you done to get things back on track? So it's actually one of those, a thing within projects that taking corrective action is a good thing. And it actually means you're making progress. So if you do happen to go down a blind alley in some piece of research, at least you realize that you stop, you back up a bit, and you go again. So you've learned something. Um, and that is progress. Um, so it's always happy to know that. Uh, so project management, another nice quote for you. So don't panic. Um, just keep going as much as you can. Um, so in project management or in projects in general, again, this comes back to communications. Silence is not golden. Um, when we're starting out on any new project, it's difficult. And asking for help and communicating are really, really good ways to get over problems in projects. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> Lots of people like giving their opinions. So when you ask for help, it's usually people are quite happy to, to give help. Um, if you're not sure, you can communicate, you can ask for help. Sometimes there, there is a thing, again, slightly off the point, in, um, in IT called Ask the Duck. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, and it's if you've got a problem in IT, you should talk to the duck, which is literally a rubber duck. And it's basically about explaining what the problem is to a third party. And usually by explaining what the problem is to someone else, or even to an inanimate object, or even writing an email, uh, you actually come up with a solution yourself. And um, so it, again, it's not necessarily true communication, but it's about that idea of sitting down and trying to explain what the situation is to someone else. We often come up with the um, with a a solution. Um, again, I guess this could come under risks as well, is don't forget you need to back up everything. Um, USB keys, external drives, emailing things to yourself if you need to. Um, obviously, if any of this includes identifiable data for patients, clients, participants, then really don't put things on USB keys or external drives unless you can also password protect them. Um, you can also use cloud storage space or research space that's available through 
various organizations. I don't know if uh, Queensland Health has anything for this. I know JCU does have research space available. Um, but from a cloud storage point of view, there's things like OneDrive, iCloud, Google Drive, Dropbox, Box, and hundreds of other different systems to save things externally so that if the worst happens, at least the data is safe somewhere. Um, when you're managing your project, it's a good idea to have document management. Um, so when you're doing a lit review or just looking for those articles, um, it's good to have some sort of citation management system. Uh, EndNote is a system that's been used for a long time. Um, I know at, uh, if uh, stu students at JCU get free, well, it's paid for by JCU access to it. Um, I personally don't like EndNote a lot. Um, but I use it when other people are using it. But I use a, a free piece of software called Zotero, which you can look up if you like. Um, and it, I find that very good for managing any type of documents, not just sort of the academic end of things, but other documents as well. Um, and been able to find them again. And also you can use uh, it to cite those documents in a paper as well. So using whatever citation style different journals are using. Um, when you're managing your documents, it's a good idea to put things into folders and give things good version names. Uh, one, a method that I use is putting in year, the year, the month, and then the day. So today, if I created a document, it'd be called 2023-0511, and then some sort of name for the document dot, you know, if it's a Word document dot whatever it is, dot, dot x or whatever it is now, if it's an Excel spreadsheet, then that or whatever. Um, and in this way, um, you, you can get a, uh, a, 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 because disk space is reasonably cheap now, you can keep different versions of the same document. And then if any particular version has problems or you remember that you deleted something three weeks ago that you probably shouldn't have, you can actually go back through the days to find out what it is. Um, and by giving it names like this, it's pretty logical um, rather than, you know, the usual ones of final, final, final draft of the final document part three or whatever you want to call your document. Um, and usually I also do this with things that I send out for feedback. And when it comes back, I attach the person's name who's giving the feedback to the end of it. And then that gives me separate documents for all the feedback plus my original document. So I'm keeping things kind of neat as well. As I said, uh, disk space is relatively cheap. So being able to create and have all these documents actually isn't a bad thing, you know. Um, when I'm looking at my data, management. So when I'm actually doing stats or doing some qualitative um, analysis, either one, I usually have three folders that I use. Uh, in folder one goes the original data that hasn't been edited in any way. Um, and that never gets touched. That's there as a basically a backup so that when you're in your second folder, which is called analysis and making changes and trying to change things and trying to do the analysis and fix things, all of that work in progress gets done there. Uh, and then if you stuff things up almightily, you can go back into your original data, pull out the right file and start over, hopefully not too much over, but um, it's one way of doing it. And then I have a third folder, which are all the outputs. So tables, graphics, um, citations that I'm going to use or uh, quotations from qualitative research that I'm going to use. Um, it could be even sometimes that can be uh, partial reports of things, you know, the uh, structure of what I'm trying to put down in maybe a final report or presentation that's based on the analysis as well. And that's it for today. Um, when I was, I was actually looking for some inspirational quotes for project management, and there is about a million and one of them. And I did spend a very, very productive hour 
procrastinating on my slides to um, um, <laughs> have some inspirational quotes for you. And instead, I just made them up as I went along. So you may recognize some of them in there. And if you do, there's bonus points. If you can tell me where they came from. Anyway, thank you very much for participating today. If you have any questions or any comments to make or anything else, please let me know. Either on mute or um, in the chat. Uh, okay, so KM, yes. Happy to share the slides. I'll be sending the slides to uh, Bonnie at TAC uh, later on, just when I finish up here, and then she'll be able to put them up online. Not a problem. Thanks, Susan. That's OK. Yes, I wanted to make it very pragmatic. There is a huge amount within project management. Um, I found out the other day you can literally do a master's in project management. <laughs> which is an awful lot of information. Um, so not quite that level of detail. Thanks, Rebecca. And Bonnie has said you can, uh, it's going up on a tax YouTube channel, the presentation. So a recording will be going up as well. Thanks, everyone. No questions. I'm happy to take questions, but it seems like I've covered a good lot. So that's good too. Thank you.